What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the Fitness Stuff for Normal People podcast. I'm Mariana. And I'm Tony. And it's no secret the fitness industry sucks, period. Whether it is the corrupt multi billion dollar supplement and weight loss industry or the endless supply of influencers promoting literally anything to drive page views. The bottom line is, we're not trying to provide just another fitness podcast, but completely change the fitness industry for the better by providing you with the knowledge and tools to give you confidence in applying the best possible training and nutrition in your own lives. And today we are doing another round robin style episode, which I'm really excited about. We love these ones. So we're taking topics that don't need the level of detail that would require an entire episode, but topics that you guys still are dying to know the answer to. Specifically today, that will be berberine supplements or what people are calling nature's ozempic, the 75 hard challenge, who should and shouldn't be doing it and why, breaking down how to tell you exactly what weight you need to be lifting for each exercise in the gym or the RPE scale and breaking down some MLM schemes in the fitness space like Arbonne and Herbalife. No, we were going to be doing another round ramen, but with how much positive feedback we got from the first one, this one might be here to stay. I like them. Mm -hmm. I like digging it in. And who doesn't like making people happy? (laughs) I do. We do. That's why we do the show. If you guys want to make Mariana and I smile ear to ear while you're listening to this intro, just take 10 seconds to give us a five-star review on whatever platform you're listening on Spotify, Apple, whatever you're doing. We will be cheesing cheek to cheek. Do that. And if you're there too on Spotify, you can now follow your favorite podcast. Hopefully it's us. So every single week when we release a new episode, it notifies you and pops it up so you don't miss one. Or if you see a topic that grabs you, you won't miss it. Outside of that, if you want to get more after each episode, join us over on the premium for just five bucks a month where you get a bonus Q&A episode every single Friday where we answer your real questions. And just by being a Fitness Stuff Premium member, you get entered in our $300 Legion Supplement giveaway every single month. We're going to put show notes. We're going to put the sign up in the show notes down below for that as well. And a quick shout out to Sponsor Sense Day One, homeboys over at Legion and homegirls. Really, only thing I want to shout out is they came out with a new flavor. Did you see that today? Rainbow yes. Sherbert pre-workout. I'm trying to pick, because I, I think I've talked about this here before. I do, for their pre-workout, I do a scoop of their stem and a scoop of their non-stem. Mm-hmm. So you still get a clinical dose of the alpha GPC, the beta alanine, the beta ene, the citrulline. You get all that, but with half the dose of caffeine, I'm trying to pick which flavor would match better with rainbow sherbet. I'm trying to think if it's either blue raspberry, green apple, or sour candy is what they have in the non-stem. Oh, I think sour. I feel That's like sour was- would mix well. That's what I think I was pulling for is a little sour candy mixed with the, I, the rainbow sherbet. I used to be a sherbet kid because I don't like ice cream. Now I don't like sherbet either. I would always have sherbet and everyone would make fun of me. <laughs> is it not the same thing? Sherbet ice and ice cream? cream? Those are Doesn't not like the, the same, same thing? thing. What's the difference? There's a huge difference. Come on. What is I, it? I don't know how to. Well... <laughs> <laughs> That's all... There's a big difference. What is it though? Okay. Well, it... sherbet isn't sorbet. It's not ice cream. Sorbet. Now you're just making up words. What's sorbet? So sherbet's main ingredient is fruit juice or puree, while ice cream's main ingredient are typically milk and cream. Did you know that off the top of your head or did you just look it up? I just looked it up. I knew it was fruit. Okay. I, I thought didn't you knew that off the top of your head. I always knew it was like the very different consistency, but also I always liked it in my head as a kid because it was fruity and not creamy. But I don't feel like that was a good explanation. <laughs> no, but it, well, okay, now I'm remembering it because we used to get a big bucket and put it in our freezer. It was like a huge yeah. bucket of sherbet, and it was really yeah. fruity. Oh, now I remember that. Mm-hmm. Dang. Okay, yeah. I hope this t- I hope this lives up to it. Yeah, so that's and me. so like sherbet falls in between. If anyone's wondering, in between sorbet and ice cream, sorbet is no dairy, I don't think, or milk at all, and it almost tastes sorbet almost tastes like a. I don't know. It has a little bit more icy taste to it, if that makes any sense. For those wondering, this is the first round of our round robin. We're talking about the difference between <laughs> sorbet. Or... No, I was like, Did you... are you just knowing all this off the top of your head? <laughs> but anywho, if you want to go check that out or try any of their other supplements, <laughs> remember, we're going to put the Legion link down in our show notes and in our bio. You can use code FSPOD or FSPOD at checkout for 20% off your first order or double points every order after that. And I'll also say... If you have the time, they sell their books, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, and Thinner, Leaner, Stronger, I think both in digital copy and paperback on their website for like five to 10 bucks. Sometimes they do sales for like one to three. That is hands down one of 
the first books I ever recommend to someone getting into the fitness nutrition training space. It is one of the single best books you could read if you want a better understanding. While you're there too, you can take that, I guess, 20% off of eight bucks is not significant. I think someone but, tagged us the other day. Yeah. Having, I think it was Meg. You. I can't remember. No, Meg <laughs> tagged it because she got it too. But yeah, like use, they're an educational company. Like use all that too down below while you're getting some rainbow sherbet. I've been told that I'm just Tony's co-host before in my comments. And oh, shut the freak up. Because people not. don't know that I'm on the podcast. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm just here for moral support of Tony. <laughs> I drop in time to time. Well, I had a nutritionist <laughs> or dietitian comment the other day saying like she's been following you for like months and months. And she's like, I had no clue you were on the podcast. I'm like, what do you, <laughs> what do you mean? You don't, <laughs> how do you know about that the podcast? That is so funny. Well, I'm like, how do you know about oh. the podcast? But you don't know that either of us are on the podcast. That cracks me up. Yeah, Anywho. it's that end of the spectrum. And then people have also thought Tony and I are married. Yeah, so that was, <laughs> that's a fun one. That's a super fun one. To explain. Oh, anyway, berberine <sighs> supplements. Woo. Let's, Let's get into talk it. About it. Okay, so that's what we're going to go. So we're going to start off with berberine and then jump into 75 hard and then mm -hmm. finish off with a little RPE, how to tell exactly what weight you need to be lifting and MLM schemes. So, okay, jump in on berberine because this is recently hot. Yeah. This, this is the is... last few months, if I could remember, right? As nature's Ozempic. And if you're unfamiliar with Ozempic, that is the Hollywood miracle fat loss drug, the injectable type 2 diabetes medication that people have been taking. The Kim mm -hmm. K, everything that just are shedding weight fast. That yeah. was kind of a huge controversy. So they're calling this nature's Ozempic. That's what yeah. they're doing. Yeah, which is just ridiculous because Ozempic works like that. It works. It's approved for weight loss and it's approved for diabetics and it works for weight loss. This is berberine. And it is a supplement. You can't just go and buy Ozempic. I mean, if you are have the connections, you have a lot of money, you're a celebrity, like, yeah, everyone's on it. It's the same shit with all the people in the fitness space being on steroids and not telling anyone. But mm -hmm. anyway, so it's a bioactive compound that can be extracted from plants. So that's like a lot of typical supplements that have been used in traditional Chinese medicine for years. And okay. it's been used to treat different ailments in Chinese medicine. And when it comes to studies on berberine, there are a lot of animal studies looking at the mechanism of it. So it's mode of action, how it mainly mm. works. And then there's also most of the human data lies in looking at type two diabetics and its effect on helping lower, helping regulate blood sugar levels. So when looking at the main potential mode of action here, we can really only pull from animal studies, but we can understand a little bit from this, but it doesn't mean anything for how this might work in humans. But yeah, like application. Yeah, it may activate an enzyme inside your cells called AMP activated protein kinase, so AMPK. And this does play a large role in regulating metabolism and energy levels in the human body. However, that doesn't mean anything for how supplementing with it might play out in human beings. Nothing. I was going to say, but, can you explain that to me like I'm five? The AMP uh, thing? So what AMPK does or how it's related to berberine? If berberine impacts it a little bit, what does that do to me? Berberine has the potential, basically, is what people are saying, to oh, okay. activate AMPK. Turn it on. So you're turning on AMPK and this AMPK is found in virtually all of the cells in your body and it plays a large role in regulating metabolism. So the thought process is take this, it'll increase an enzyme that quote unquote increases your metabolism. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And makes you burn fat, all that fun stuff that you We're can up to a good pull start. from- <laughs> Not this doesn't mean anything. It's just analyzing a potential function. And mm -hmm. but anyway, it made researchers, scientists want to look at its effect in type two diabetics because they noticed some relationship there with how it can help manage blood sugar in animal data. So they take it and look at, at it in human data. So many studies have shown that berberine can be effective at lowering blood glucose levels in those with type 2 diabetes, specifically those with type 2 diabetes. And this was a large meta-analysis in 12 different studies that they looked at this. I wanted to pull out a specific one. So this is a 2008 study of 116 people with diabetes. So not gigantic, but mm -hmm. significant enough to draw some conclusions. And they took one gram of berberine per day 
and it lowered fasting blood glucose by 20%. Now, if you thought of that number, just if you looked at that and took that at face value, that's huge. That's a pretty significant result. But this study also included lifestyle and dietary interventions that were not controlled for. So it's really, you can't say that it was just because of, you can't really say at all that it was because of the berberine supplement because diet wasn't controlled for. So that's what makes this difficult. And a lot of the studies, diet is not controlled for, even if there were no dietary interventions, they didn't look at any diet or lifestyle at all. So it's really hard to study a supplement that way. However, when looking at this, when with people who were taking diabetes medication, what's the typical one? Why can't I remember it? Is there like a- Metformin? Metformin, yes, yes. So they analyzed those on metformin and those not with both the type 2 diabetes and the people who did not, were not on metformin were taking, they had them take berberine and compare that to those on it. And its effect was- very similar to those taking metformin, not as significant, but they still saw a significant difference in their overall blood sugar levels. Short-term, short-term studies. These have all been short-term studies, not many long-term studies, but that shows a lot of potential. And so that's that's where this, yeah, that's where this can definitely, and I think there's going to be a lot more research in the future, looking at this more long-term data. There are definitely medications that this can interact with. I'm not at all Mm-hmm. going to recommend a type 2 diabetic to take berberine because I am not your doctor and that's not my yeah. place. Any supplement has the potential to interact with medication. That's not what I know predominantly about. So it's but if you do have type 2 diabetes and you want to bring that up with your doctor, I think it's definitely worth while for yeah. sure because there is potential there. Um, Cuz here's something about for those unaware for in type 2 diabetics, your blood sugar is naturally going to be higher than someone Normal. Because I think with today's social media, the trend is just that like the lower, like lowering blood sugar is good. It's not like, yes. oh, well, where, what are you lowering it from? Because if you have low blood sugar and you're lowering it even further, that's not a good thing. Because type yeah. two diabetics for like those unaware, and this will be like a simple breakdown. If you take your, if you do a little finger prick in the morning and check your blood sugar levels, like your fasted blood glucose test is what they usually do with the doctors, things like that too. Mm-hmm. If it's like 70 to 100, you're normal. You're healthy. That's great. If you are above 126 is what technically categories like says pretty much you're going to be in the diabetic range. Type two diabetic range is you're over 126. And typically if you're type two, your blood sugars through the day are going to be between like 126 upwards of like 200 plus sometimes. Mm-hmm. So I'm even thinking there like a 20% reduction for them that brings them even closer and closer back to normal where you want to be, where yeah. if you're a normal human being and you're already at like a hundred, or sitting around there, lowering it by 20%, that could be, that could bring you into a low hypoglycemic level. Very dangerous. Yeah. That's not always a good thing. I think people just associate now today, like, oh, lower blood sugar equals good without fully understanding where we're starting from. Yeah. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those side effects after I talk about the weight loss piece, because I'm sure that that's what a lot of people are wondering about because it is called nature's Ozempic. So how is this causing people to lose weight? You see the before and after photos, people coming up on TikTok. I've been taking berberine for however long and I've lost this many Mm -hmm. pounds. Here's my picture, right? I almost vomited when this, I see her all the time for whatever reason. And I don't block her strictly because I get tagged in her videos all the time and I want to be able to respond. But very thin, very thin, beautiful, lovely, taking berberine for because of her wedding, which is all kinds of fucked up in so many ways. It's like the type of person where it's like how it, you're going to disappear. And she's just talking about how she feels so fatigued and has such a bad headache and has no energy and no appetite. It's like, yeah, your blood sugar is too low because it's lowering your blood sugar. So it, it just – the. Ugh, it's just what people do and they get on and they say, and this is how trends start. And nobody really thinks to look past it. Nobody th- mm-hmm. thinks that this could have serious negative side effects, but people will pull some research too, which is this, a lot of which comes from this systematic review and meta-analyses of the 12 studies that I mentioned earlier. They also did look at weight changes in the study and found that it could moderately reduce body weight in those type with type two diabetes or metabolic mm. disorders. 
in combination with dietary and lifestyle changes. So they noticed that there was a change in weight over the duration of, on average, all of these studies, right? Okay. But this is typically what you would expect because this supplement can help keep your blood sugar regulated in addition mm -hmm. to whatever else they are doing. And a common symptom of diabetes, and Tony, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, is hyperphagia. And that is this almost extreme hunger. It's really hard to regulate your hunger levels. You can have more cravings. It's sometimes what people experience. And it can be a sign of diabetes. You can experience it at different levels. Some can have it mm -hmm. more intensely than others. But when you regulate your blood sugar, it is very common to also see appetite regulated as well. And so if people have more regular appetite, aren't having as many intense cravings or as intense hunger, it is very likely they're going to be eating less and you see weight loss. Yeah. Kind of like what that, Ozempic was doing too, right? Essentially just zap. I mean, not to nearly the, the degree. A very, Ozempic, not even the same mechanism. Yeah, not even the same ballpark, all. but it was working yeah. with hunger essentially yes. where Ozempic zapped it like essentially in that like to a dangerous degree. Ozempic has a direct effect on it's like the mechanism is very sound, well yeah. studied. It okay, but this works. is why you think they're calling it nature's Ozempic probably is just because it, I mean, it's not the same thing, but it sounds like the same thing. Because it's a supplement if, that people are saying causes weight loss is essentially yeah. why. But there is, it is not even, it doesn't even act in any way, shape or form similarly to how Ozempic acts. There yeah. is no defined there's no defined mechanism for weight loss in terms of bur when it comes to berberine yeah. in human beings. So much more research is needed and we don't know if it was due to the supplement, if it was due to these dietary and lifestyle changes. It hasn't been compared to those not for weight yeah. loss purposes. It hasn't been compared to those not taking berberine. There's so many things that haven't been yeah, hundreds considered, of um, but that is what you would expect expect to see some weight loss when you're managing your diabetes properly. Yeah. That that's ex that would be expected. And then you go into circling back to what Tony was talking about, people who do not have diabetes taking this. It does lower your blood sugar. So if you have no reason to be lowering your blood sugar, you will go into if you're taking this as it's prescribed for diabetics into a hypoglycemic state which can be very dangerous. You could have fatigue. It's not fun. Dizziness. I'll tell you firsthand, it's not that fun. People <laughs> faint, fun. lack of appetite. Like there's so many things and especially this can have an effect on people's appetite as well. And so that's also why they're talking, calling it nature's ozone. Yeah. But that's not a state that you want to be putting your body into. No. That can be really dangerous. It's and not people good are talking about it in the context of very short term to like, people who just start taking it. I don't know. If, mm. Nobody knows if this levels out, if you need to start increasing your dose. Nobody, it's not, it's not studied. But we don't know. It's just anecdotal information. Um, but other side effects include a lot of GI distress and upset, either diarrhea or constipation, especially if you are taking it at a dose that is not meant for the healthy population, you're increasing the risk for the negative side effects of it. And is it safe to take over a long period of time? Don't know. That it's just I have no way idea. too many it's question also marks. A supplement. And just to even like reiterate, because you've said it a hundred times, and I want to say it a hundred more. We don't know if it's safe, and it's not like oh, we don't know if it's safe, and it's essentially like Ozempic. It's not like Ozempic at no. all. That's it's not like you're getting. So I won't. I don't want people hearing like oh, it's a little dangerous, but I might. No, it's not going to be the same thing. And For it makes sense that you see weight loss in type two diabetics because insulin and the two hunger hormones like leptin and ghrelin they play a, like a little dance in the body together where mm -hmm. the rise and, and drop of each of them will influence each other's response. Yeah. So yeah. it makes a lot of sense where if you have naturally elevated hyperglycemic blood sugar levels in like a type two diabetic, if you bring that down to a normal range between 80 and 120, you'll probably have a much more normal appetite. It doesn't zap your mm -hmm. appetite like Ozempic does. It doesn't do the same thing at all, but you'll have a more normal appetite compared to usual. But if you already are in that 80 to 120 range because you don't have diabetes, you don't want to go below that. Like there's a Goldilocks zone that you want to stay in. Yeah. Lower does not equal better. That's yeah. the funny part to me. 
Yeah. And it's, I mean, Ozempic's a prescription drug. For anything to be a prescription drug, you have to have a vast amount of human research that shows that it is safe and effective. Ozempic, long term, it is, there was no known risk for long term, but it wasn't known. So long term, we don't know, Mm -hmm. but the risk was, so risk assessment, that's not my area of expertise, but when it comes to drugs, there's a certain level of, okay, the risk is not too high. So it's okay for it to be classified as a prescription drug. Yeah. What that means, I'm not a pharmacist. I don't know. But there is plenty of data that has allowed it to get approved by the FDA to be a drug. And this was years in the making for weight loss. For weight loss, that has been – I know people are like, oh, it's been around forever. No. That has been such a battle for it to get approved specifically for weight loss because of the lack of long-term research. And it went into researchers now trying to prove the risk being low versus, you know, we can't prove the long-term because we don't have people on it long-term yet. So I just really want to point that out. Supplements, prescription drugs, not even closely to being the same thing. You don't need any evidence to become a supplement that you market for something. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Whenever you see a supplement that's marketed as like nature's this or whatever, and they're comparing it to a prescription medication, red flag. Like it's not like there's nothing can be like, I know like I see a lot of people, Oh, this is nature's Adderall. This is this nature's Ozempic. It's like that right away. Turn around. That's not going to be what you think it is. Yeah. And before anyone, I just want to put this one final note in that is amazing that there is a natural supplement that maybe people can take I, again, I'm doing emphasis on the maybe. Maybe people can take a smaller dose of their medication, which may have more riskier side effects in the long term. Maybe it can help them lose mm-hmm. weight so that they can get off their medication oh, yeah. in the future type of thing. I think that it, that is a wonderful thing. I think that's really fascinating. But still. Yeah. In the right the hands. Same. In the right <laughs> hands. In the right hands. Now, that is – round robin one the funniest thing is we keep calling it round robin and i forgot the last time we looked up it's not even really what round robin means but it just what does round robin mean i like the alliteration who cares Uh, i think a round robin is like in a tournament style sporting event is where one team plays each team instead of doing like a tournament like a bracket style that's what Ah. i think it is but i like it just i like the sound of it robins are pretty birds stuff like that but anyway we're going on to number two 75 hard y'all have heard of it if you haven't you've been living under a rock have you heard of it? I mean, you've, I'm assuming you've heard about 75 hard. Oh I mean, people God, shove it yeah. in your face usually. And it, it, especially around the new year's, I wish we did this around the new year's time. Cause that's when everyone starts it. Mm-hmm. And I would love to see, I would love to see how many finish, but and it's essentially what it is. And this is I'll preface by saying I've done the challenge. I've done the challenge. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. This was in, I think 2019 years oh ago, God. but essentially COVID? wait, no, yeah, COVID it actually was, it was right before COVID 2019. So right before COVID. Yeah. But what it is, is a challenge created by Andy Frisilla. He's the CEO of First Form, the supplement company. Very motivational guy on social media is why a lot of people follow him. I think back on a podcast years ago where he came up with it, he said it's the 75 hard challenge. Let's be clear here because a lot of times in this industry, something is made for one purpose and then people that aren't even the ones making it, people on social media, anywhere else, they take it and twist it into something completely different. And I think that's what happened here. It was made as a transformative mental toughness challenge. That's on their 75 hard website. That's what it is. A transformative mental toughness challenge. Notice how there's nothing in there about physical health, body composition, anything. It's about mental toughness, right? And it's really meant, he said on the list on the website, it's meant to build mental toughness, fortitude, confidence, self-esteem, self-worth, self-belief, and grit. That's what it's made for. The rules of this, and I think it's been extrapolated and changed probably a million different ways by now. I know you were saying there's a 75 soft challenge. There's mm-hmm. there's any rule and exception in it, but the original game is that you have to drink, and this is an every day for 75 days straight, no days off challenge. You have to drink one gallon of water every day for 75 days. You have to read 10 pages of a book. And as it was created, it was a self-help help book too. So 10 pages of a physical self-help book every day. Take a progress photo every single day. Follow a set diet perfectly, meaning zero cheat days, zero off days, nothing. 
a set diet and you have the flexibility at least to choose that. So if you want to do keto, great. You have to do that every single day. If you want to do macros, if you want to do whatever, you just have to do it every single day without skipping a beat. And the hard, I would say hardest part next to diet is the last step. You have to complete two 45 minute workouts every single day Fuck. for 75 days straight. And one of those workouts is required to be outdoors. It could be a walk. It could be yoga in the park. But one of those 45 minute workouts has to be outside, has to be outside. And the challenge is you have to do that every single day for 75 days straight. If you miss any one of those five requirements on any single day, you lose. That's what it is. And I think what people turned it into is kind of like a jump start challenge to a diet, like a whole 30, which has its purpose, but people don't use whole 30 usually for how it's intended to, or any 30 day challenge that you see on the internet. That's what people turned it into. Right. And I know when I did it, because I think as a mental toughness challenge, it's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. I'll stand by it. If you want to test your grit, I don't think there's anything else that's going to make you stay like true to your word, build your integrity, anything like that. But I think people are like, oh, well, I need to improve my body composition. I need to lose some weight. Because a lot of people you see on the 75 hards will post their transformation photos because that's one of the daily requirements from beginning to end. Now, if you actually can follow a diet, for 75 days and you're training two times a day, you're going to lose weight. Does that mean it's healthy? Does that mean it's sustainable? No. But when people see a before and after photo of 75 days that someone lost 30 pounds and they've been struggling to lose weight, I mean, that's, would that catch your eye? Yeah. Obviously. But it's, it's also like how sustainable is that? I would like to see like a post 75 hard, like how <laughs> exactly like, like a post 75 let me see how do you feel like... after if it's kind of like oh that sucked i can't like i know people will say they're feeling great and some people do keep up like it's not meant to do forever but you keep up with a lot of the habits i'm still mm -hmm. working out every day i'm still thinking about my diet but then you have the camp that don't say anything because it is a crash yeah, because diet. it's very <laughs> and that's my big thing because when i went through it and i didn't make it through the challenge i do want to i want to say that i did not make it through the 75 challenge do I have a legitimate, I don't like to use excuses, but I'll say the reason that I stopped was actually because I was telling you this right before the episode. It ended with me in the hospital because I remember this is a little fun. We'll do story time with Tony real quick because this was one of my favorite stories. This was at the time of my life, it was 2019. So I had just quit my corporate job where I was managing a gym to start Bloom, to start my company. And as I did that, did I do it in the most responsible way where I saved up a year's worth of salary so I could do, no I didn't do that but what that? I did beforehand <laughs> is I worked with my best friend Kirsty who still lives out in Atlanta this is where I was at the time and she was a GM of a couple different local like brew pubs restaurants and she's like hey if you want to start your business and you could work on it during the day let me teach you how to be a bartender and we would study during night stuff like that and then I could be a bartender which makes pretty dang good money and work from like 4 p.m. till midnight or 1 a.m. And then I could wake up at 7, 8 and work on Bloom from 8 until that shift. So it gave me actual like daytime to work with clients to build the business. It was the perfect kind of fit, but it stretched me thin, right? Like starting a business is one thing and then staying up until 1 or 2 in the morning working mm -hmm. bar shifts is another thing, which is a phenomenal job, by the way. But I was already kind of running low and I was all into the improvement mindset. I was doing this. So I'm like, screw it. Let me do the 75 hard challenge. And this was also in, I think, November, December in Georgia, which they give it the nickname Hot Lana for Atlanta. It gets freaking cold in the wintertime. I don't, it's the silliest nickname I've ever heard, but it gets cold. And one of my brilliant ideas was that three of my outdoor workouts per week, my apartment complex had a pool that they did not keep heated in the wintertime. So it was freezing cold, like freezing, freezing cold. I was like, you know what? Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm going to go swim laps and then finish with a walk in there. Remember the ice baths at Aloe? Like that's what it felt like. Yeah. Cold. So I started doing that and I think I made it, it was 39 days in. I will say this because I actually really liked it because it makes you commit to something. And it's like, I said, I would do it. It makes you follow through with your word, which I think is very understated because at least where I was in life, I would say I'd hang out with friends. I'd say I'd work, wake up early to work out. And then it wouldn't take much for me to just change my mind. Like, Oh no, I can just go later. I made plans mm -hmm. to hang out with friends. I'm not going to do it anymore. I didn't stick to my word every single time. And this kind of made you do it, which I think is a very positive aspect of that. 
-hmm. And it would get to the point where, I mean, I would, for the second workout a day, I'd get off the bar shift at like 11 PM and still have to do a 45 minute walk outside in the cold. And I'd, you'd have to do it or else you'd lose. And I was, I mean, that only took one or two times of doing it to be like, screw this. I'm waking up early. There's no chance in hell I'm going to do that again. So I'd wake up early to do it, but it, it kind of instilled that, which is good, but you got to remember, and we preach this on this podcast, rest and recovery is one of the most important aspects of your health, physical progress aside, your overall health. So if you're putting that much stress on your body with two different workouts every single day with no days off, and then I was the idiot who was also doing freezing cold swims. I was sleeping five or six hours a night because of the shifts. It ended up bad, but essentially I was telling you, I ended up getting the flu, terrible flu. And I'm a type one diabetic, which it elevated my blood sugar levels. Oh, we were just talking about this to like, it was stuck in the three, four hundreds and it would not come down. It was like, my body was resistant to insulin. So I had to be taken to the ER by my friend Kirsty uh, until it came down. And they're like, Hey, do you have any idea why this is happening? I'm like, I have no clue. I think I caught a bug. But, but they're like, stop doing that. So I didn't make it. Yeah. I didn't make it through the challenge. But again, it really instilled. And I still have things today that I think because of that challenge, I hold to it, right? Like being like, if I say I'm going to do something, I do it 100% of the time. It makes you be very careful with what you commit to, which I think is very powerful. And a lot of people could really benefit from. So I don't want to take away from what it was made to do. It's incredible at improving your mental strength. But if you're using it as a jumpstart challenge, or, and this is just, clear common sense to me. If you can't make three workouts a week consistently for a span of 75 days, or if you can't stick to a diet for more than two weeks, including the weekends, all you're doing when you start a 75 hard challenge or any jumpstart challenge like this is you're extending the time until you actually reach your end goal. It's just a distraction. It's a fun little yeah. distraction that you're going to do until you fail and wind up at square one again saying, what do I do now? That's what it is used for. I think a lot of people use it for. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. yeah, I've never been. I think it's cool when people can finish it. And I like, I think that's awesome. If you can, if you do it, I think that's something to be proud of for sure. But sometimes all or it's kind of like an all or nothing approach. Yeah. Which... Well, that's from like, if you turn it into like a weight loss challenge, or if you don't have a healthy relationship with your progress first. And that's what I'm like, honestly, when people ask me about it, I'm like, if you haven't reached your physical goals yet, don't even think about it because this is not, this is going to get you much further away from whatever goal you have. But if you turn it into that, it does reinforce a lot of negative aspects that come with like a crash diet. It reinforces that like false dichotomy of things are either good or bad because you have to stick to a diet or it's bad or you have yeah. to hit workouts. It really reinforces all the negative things. And that's why I'm like, it's, it's a distraction from what you need to be doing. Because yeah. if you haven't and been it, able to make it work yet, it's like you need to be working on not going in with that black and white mindset. You need to be working on balance. You need to work on flexibility. Fitting things into your lifestyle is what you need to be working on, not reinforcing the bad habits that keep you stuck in the one place you are. Because that's yeah. 100 It just reinforces all the crash diet. It's for a very specific for. population, like a very specific yeah. person. It is not meant for beginners at all if you're trying to just – start no. going to the gym or maybe you have a, some weight to lose and you've never attempted to lose weight before. It's not for the people who have done every single yo-yo diet under the sun. It's not for the people who have disordered eating. It's not for the people who hate, have kids and have a life that they have mm. to adhere to. It's for the single person who is obsessed with the gym and feels like they need something more or who feels like they're kind of out of their routine and has time to dedicate to that and wants to feel like I can accomplish something because I just haven't really been I know yeah. I feel like I could do it I really feel like I could do this and I would feel like it would benefit me to do it and I can dedicate it, the time to it like the type of person that really feels confident that they can achieve it you know yeah it's not something to lightly just hop into like, oh, that yeah. sounds like a fun thing to do. It's like you really, because 75 days is a long freaking time. It doesn't sound like that, but it's a long time to commit to something that hardcore. Because I think it was even, I mean, the two-a-day workouts, I had to do some of those when I was on vacation with my family, when I was working double shifts, when I was doing all this, you have to do it every day. Like that's the whole point of it. Even from a health aspect, we talk about why recovery and rest is so important, but it's like, if you're overtraining, right? Stress can be a good thing and a bad thing. It's not one or the other. It's dose dependent. 
But if you're pouring stress on top of your body by taking zero rest days, zero recovery days, like you realize all that does, it's suppressing hormones like testosterone. It's increasing hormones like cortisol to most likely an unsafe level. You're going to have feelings of mood disruption, of depression. It's going to lower your sleep quality. It's going to increase your daily fatigue and lethargy. That's why it's meant for a mental toughness challenge is because it makes your, it breaks you down mentally. It doesn't make you feel better. It makes you feel like crap. And that's where you get the mental toughness is by making it through. But people mm -hmm. are like, oh, it's going to make me feel better. It's like, I promise it won't. It might for the first week, if you were binge drinking before and you stopped and you're now drinking a lot of water, you might feel great for a week. But wait until week two or week three. And then a huge one too I see a lot of times is you get those overuse injuries because your muscles, it takes a day or two to recover for the most part. But your joints, your ligaments, your bones, these tendons, those take time to recover from. So if you're constantly pounding them in every single day, you see those overuse injuries pop up a lot. And that's where, because I'm like, it's, yeah, again, I mean, with everything, with the Burberry and everything, it's not good or bad, the 75 hard challenge. It's just that you got to be really intentional for why you're using it and for the right reasons. Because I'll still say, I mean, that built my self-confidence more than I think almost anything I've ever done in my life. Mm -hmm. I realized like if I can't even trust my own word, right? If someone gave me their word and they keep breaking it and breaking it, I wouldn't trust them. So if I'm doing that to myself, I'm like, I can't even trust myself. So once you build that like insane level of confidence and trust with yourself, you're like, oh, you can take out on anything. And it's huge. I love that aspect of it. But you see it on social media and it's like, what, maybe one out of every hundred posts are using it to do that. Mm -hmm. And the rest are doing it for a transformation or doing it for that. And it's like, nah, that's not where we're at. So let's do it. You want to do it? Start Monday? No. no? I okay. want to talk about MLMs. I'll circle back. <laughs> Let's hit MLMs. Now, this one's a good one because MLMs, you get hit up a lot for people on these. I haven't gotten hit up in a while. Herbalife Most, is it's one. It's mostly targeted towards women, multi-level level marketing. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. It makes sense because I haven't gotten, someone hit me up in like high school, I think, about Herbalife, mm -hmm. but I haven't been talked about it too yeah, much. Yeah, men do it too, but it is large. It's The industry is dominated by women. Um, mm -hmm. That is almost used for it to be like women empowerment. Like look at us in our starting our own business. Oh, it's so manipulative. I hate them. All right. So what is, if you don't know what multi-level marketing is, it's also known as direct marketing or network marketing. And it's a method of selling products directly to consumers using independent sales representatives. So they tend to appeal to new recruits with promises of wealth and financial freedom, independence, having your all of your time back. You don't have to work for it. It's like all of these promises, people will show their new car that they bought because of it and their new, all, it is insane. You can how, vacation 360 yeah. days a year. You can do <laughs> everything. And they use people instead of retail outlets to sell their products to customers. And this puts the responsibility for selling into the hands of independent distributor networks. And there's a few different levels of those. But under this MLM model, distributors are not employees of the company, they're individual business owners, I'm saying in air quotes, who recruit their own distributor networks to help them sell products. So there's different levels of this. That's why I was, it's called an MLM. And typically they'll try to recruit people they know, other people on social media. That's why they're in my DMs all of the time. Arbon, for example, and you could go, I really like to see people's stories on social media who got out of the MLMs and what their experience was like. But Arbon, for example, you had a number that you had to meet each month in terms of sales. If you're a consultant, you have to bring in this much money every month. If you don't, you lose your job. And this is what these people who get recruited into these, they quit their jobs. They do this. This is what they do full time because they are told that this is going to make them all this money. They quit their jobs to do this. And a lot of people end up buying the products themselves and going into a significant amount of debt. Oh, because I forgot about that aspect. I remember yes. buying just fill up their garages because they'd be like, I can just resell this later. Oh my gosh, yes. I forgot about that. Yeah. And so many people go into a significant amount of debt. And though it's not illegal by definition, Many MLMs have become infamous for their controversial business practices, and others have been revealed to be 
a little more than illegal pyramid schemes and some businesses get taken down, but it doesn't happen all the time. But let's just talk about Arbon because I've been getting tagged so much in recently. They call it the green gut glow bundle is what the product is. They beat but us to multiple, it. multiple people are getting on the internet, selling it as this deep bloat drink, not they won't show you'll, you'll kind of see the product, but you won't see the name of it. They won't write the name of it. You have to go to their link, which, you know, mm. I did my back end research for you guys. So you don't have to nobody do this. So I don't want them getting any commission, <clears throat> but you have to go jump through these hoops to get the link. And they won't even say what the product name is, but you'll see it on the website because they don't mm. want people to know that they're trying to sell you a product because then it's obvious that this is an MLM. And it will say, it will come up with their own dashboard, the person's name, and because you bought it through them. And if you become a yearly member, you'll get an even bigger discount. This thing is $220 with all these discounts, but you have to sign up. You have to give money in order to get these discounts. I think That's so much at face value, Perfect. it was like 300 something. What a deal. And it's your classic, like there are these laxatives and greens powders. And this is just one product. Arbonne has makeup and they also have like vegan makeup that they market and they're not vegan. That's been a whole, I think they've gotten a lot of class action lawsuits against them. They have so many different supplements and their gut health ones are just essentially over the counter laxatives that you could go get at a CVS. And they're selling just the laxatives on their own for $58 when you could get that for $12. And they make a promise to a population of vulnerable people that, you know, this is going to give you a flat stomach. This is going to make you less bloated. And they target that customer wherever they do it. Typically it's social media. And that's in order to sell them a product, make a promise to you based on a common insecurity to their target audience, target customer, so that they can sell their products. That is their business model. They do it for everything, not just this Arbon yeah. drink, not just Arbon, but that's how they sell. So Arbon has a breakdown of the average annual wages that their different types of consultants get. So they have five different tiers of consultants. Bottom tier is an independent consultant. That is 63% of all consultants. So the majority of okay. consultants. Six out of 10 Average, people. they make $223 a year. Oh, that's a year? 63% of consultants for Arbon. And this is, I, I'm going to see if we have the ability, if anyone's watching, to put up in it, this image because they have this available. This is public information. If not, we can include a link for you guys to look at this because they have a little bit more in detail and it's just insane. And then their next tier is district managers. That's 25% of people, of consultants. $1,768 a year. $1,000 a year. Area managers, 8% of consultants, $9,207 a year. All right. You know, we're getting a little bit bigger. Here we go. 3% 3% are regional vice presidents. That's 3% of the consultants. And they make $34,293 a year. All right. We got a bit, if that's a side hustle for 3% of the people, then yeah, yeah that's what I would look at that as a worthwhile side hustle. But again, this yeah. is 3%. And then the 1% of consultants are national vice presidents and they make $150,000 a year. But just the 1% of people. That is 1% yeah. of the people. And that's, I'm sorry, depending on where you live, maybe in this, there are a lot of MLMs down South. That is where a lot of them originate. So like, I mean, $150,000 a year in Texas is completely different from Massachusetts, but either way, that is 1%. That is 1%. That's insane. Well, and not even in, I think because a lot of people will argue, because I've talked about Herbalife before, very, almost identical setup more sports supplements, protein powder, stuff like that. And not even that the ethics of how the companies run are necessarily wrong in our opinion, but their products and people are like, well, what about their, pro- their products are these companies put so little money into developing their products. Oh my God. They're they just need, it's essentially the product is just a vehicle that they're able to, mm-hmm. or like able to stay as like a legal corporate entity. That's yeah. what they're using these products for. Not a health line, not a supplement. For example, I think like the Herbalife protein for like 55 bucks 
55 bucks has like mm -hmm. 15 grams of protein. It's one of the lowest quality proteins you can get, even though it's one of the most expensive. Yeah. But it's made there. It's like 15 grams of protein, 110 calories, less than 30 servings. Like these quality of the supplements. And that's not even so They're even if you're, you get past overpriced. the ethics, you can yeah. get because some people have messaged me like, oh, well, I buy them from my friend because that are the product. The, you could get so much better quality products for such a more affordable price. That's um, the thing, too. Go buy mirror like I'm not telling you to do this because Miralax, unless if you were told to go buy Miralax, let's just make that clear. But if you're trying to increase your, you know, regularity, don't spend $58 on it. Go spend $12 on it at CVS for something that's going to last you like thir probably 60 days versus a 20 to 30 day supply. It's exactly. They're, I mean, they're using, I think, I wonder if they're using like the supplement industry too, just because they know how unregulated. Oh, the, for sure. It is because like you can get away with claims. Get, it's very hard to get taken down because you don't need any evidence to show that that's the supplement industry. And the people yeah. at the top of these businesses, the owners, the founders, they are snakes. They are snakes. I'm like, I honestly, I forgot these were a thing, but that's what even kills me. Yeah. Even if it's fundamentally wrong from a business perspective, it's like for the protein thing, you're getting a soy and whey concentrate, not even a whey isolate. That's why we recommend like why we love Legion's isolate. But a soy and whey concentrate blend of 15 grams of protein, nowhere near what you would get out of somewhere else. So it's not just, it's wrong on almost just every avenue that it's you could go so for. Bad. You can't, it's hard to justify what it is. You're not getting better products. You're not getting better service. You're not getting better convenience. So just keep an eye out, ladies and gentlemen, keep an eye out for those is what we're saying. That's all. Mm -hmm. Make informed decisions. <sighs> Should we wrap things up with the RPE scale? How yes. much weight? Let's talk about it. Okay. I love this because I don't think a lot of people use it. And it's one of the first, when I get a new client, that's usually our first or second Zoom calls when we go over what this is because it's so important to use. And even more and more research has come out lately. I know there's like, there's a lot of, not a lot. There's several people online who will take away from it or say you shouldn't use it for X, Y, Z. But I know the guys over at Data Driven Strength, there's a handful of them. They have like a strength-based programming company actually are doing some ongoing research and actually just finished them up too. They were even looking, even in training novice, like brand new tr people into weight training and experienced trainers, all are using this scale pretty accurately because it does take some accurate assessment of how hard you're working. But essentially, let me start with what it is. If you've never heard of it, right? The RPE scale, right? Is essentially a tool that can help you determine exactly what weight you need to be lifting during every single exercise. And that's something I think a lot of people, especially getting into the gym, have a hard, that's, it's one of the first skills you have to learn is like, how heavy can I go? How heavy is too heavy or how light is too light? It's a big thing to really dial that in. And RPE stands for the rate of perceived exertion, right? That's what the RPE stands for, right? So just a tool to help me measure how hard you're exerting your effort during exercise. You're essentially rating each set on a scale of one to 10. If I asked you after a set, how hard was that set based on the weight you used? on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the hardest, one being the easiest. And we're gonna go into the exact numbers here in a minute, but why I like this is because any rating scale on one to 10, how good is that burger you just had? How much pain are you in on a scale of one to 10? It's a very subjective number, right? If I asked you how much pain are you in because you're in the hospital, right? Like those little pain scales. And you're like, uh, well, I'm a 10. What does that mean? There's nothing that could possibly be more painful than you're in right now. Oh, well, technically there's, so maybe I'm a nine. And you keep, you know what I'm saying? It's hard to say what's the difference between a six and a seven or a seven and a nine, right? When it's all that subjective, it's really hard to base anything off of. The RPE scale is trying to make your subjective feelings about that exercise into a more objective number, a more concrete number that we can all agree on, right? So if you can understand how to use RPE, it's just helpful really when lifting weights because it gives you a simple and scientific way to know when it's safe to push harder or when you need to pull back and chill out, which is massively important for avoiding plateaus, overtraining, burnout. So you can actually keep making progress, right? It just it allows you to make muscle and strength gains as quickly as possible while reducing your risk for injury, overreaching, and plateauing. Now, I do want to mention, because it's cool, where the RPE originated, it's called the Borg RPE scale. If you just Google RPE yeah. scale, that might pop up. And it was essentially, it was just named after a Swedish researcher. I don't, I forgot his first name, last name Borg, but he introduced this concept in the 1950s, I believe it was. And the original RPE scale was actually a scale of six to 20. 
right? Which seems a bit random, which makes me laugh a little bit. It's like, how hard was this on a scale of six to 20? It's like, well, that's a little random, right? Like why not go one to 15 or whatever that is. But it's kind of funny because there's actual little reasoning behind it is because if you multiply whatever rating you got by 10, that was supposedly going to aim at your heart rate at that exertion. So if you rated yourself a 10 out of six to 20, you'd multiply that by 10, your heart rate would be around hundred beats per minute. And this was mainly used and originated for aerobic exercise or cardio. Yeah. And it's used for, it's used on a, they've adjusted it since then. And it's now a scale of one to 10 for the RP scale for your aerobic exercise, endurance, heart health. And a lot of runners use this and you test it for your VO2 max. I know that was when I was first introduced to the RP scale was an exercise physiology lab when we were doing our VO2 max testing on the treadmill. And every time you increased your speed, you would have to say what your, you would have to point to what your RPE is at oh, that cool. speed. And you can use, you use your RPE to also help calculate your VO2 max and your like efficiency at which you pump blood and oxygen throughout your body. So it, it's really fascinating what it's used for yeah, aerobic wise it's as well. So needed. Even though we're not going to talk about it. Yeah. But it was so cool that he made it up like, cause that was so needed just to develop like research and like controlling how hard you're working. Yeah. Right. And the two main problems with the original Borg and why it's not really used today, especially in weight training is, I mean, one, because it was originated for aerobic yeah. use. And then two, heart rates vary so much by person to person. That's why it's turned into so many modified versions of that scale. And I think he even came out with the modified Borg scale, which is a little bit different. Now, I think, and this is where I could trace it back to Mike, to sharer is who I could trace it back to in power. He's a powerlifting coach and he's the first one to translate RPE into weightlifting by relating it to something called RIR reps in reserve. And this is where, and I'm going to preface this. Like I tell everybody I'm telling, if I'm telling my client, if I'm telling anybody, we're going to throw a lot of numbers around for like five seconds. It's going to make sense. It's going to be really confusing first, but once you make it through, it's going to make a lot more sense. Right. But essentially when you're using it for weight training, because right now you're like, how the hell do I use this to tell how much weight I should use? It's a scale of one to 10. Your RPE scale is a scale of one to 10. Again, one being the easiest, 10 being the hardest or your absolute max effort. Now, the most commonly used, because there's probably a hundred different iterations of the RPE scale, but the most commonly used in like lifting weights was developed by this guy, Mark Teixeira. And essentially it's going to be the direct inverse of something measuring called RIR or reps in reserve. And this is something that's very easy to put a number on, not very easy, much easier to put a number mm -hmm. on. And essentially what it's just asking you to do is at the end of a set, right? Let's say I'm doing squats and I just did 10 squats with 135 pounds and I rack the weight. It's asking you how many more reps could you have done until you fail, right? And I put it like this, like and it's to failure, which is a lot harder than a lot of people think their training effort is gun to your head. How many more reps could you have done before? I just sat down to squat and I could not get back up, right? How many more reps could you do it? And when I say it's, it works in direct inverse and I'll try and I wonder if I could post this on my story again, I have a post from a long time ago where I actually post the scale in the description of it, but an RPE of 10 is your absolute max effort, meaning zero reps in reserve. If I had a gun can, to your head, I can share my screen right now. Can you share, we could post, I'll even post it in the show notes. Yeah. Cause to, if I share my screen, that's what will come up for them. This, but for people right. on like Apple and stuff like that too, I'll put it in the show notes regardless. Oh, true of it. But essentially RPE 10, right? That's your max effort, right? Absolute max effort, zero reps in reserve. So 10 is zero reps in reserve. Meaning if I had a gun to your head, I said, Hey, I'm going to murder. This is going to get real dark. I was like, I'm gonna murder your family. Let's say something worse. I'll take away your Chipotle rights for a year, whatever. You could not stand up to save your life, to save Chipotle, to do anything. That's what that number means. If you're working at an RPE of 10, you failed. An RPE of nine is meaning one rep in reserve, meaning you could have done one more until you failed after you racked the set. RPE of eight is two reps in reserve, right? RPE of seven is three reps in reserve. So that's where it goes inverse for every one score down on the RPE, one up on the RIR. And it even goes, and I won't do this into much detail because you can even break it into like 8.5, 9.5, and you can go further, but I think verbally it would be a little more confusing than mm -hmm. visually. It'll make more sense, right? But you're essentially doing that. And where the goal of this is then is to set an RPE goal. 
and this is going to loop around and make sense, I promise. Because I think an old style measure, and I bet you probably got this a lot when you were training with athletes, is the whole idea of you got to train as hard as possible all the time. If you're not training to absolute failure, you're not going to grow. You're not going to make progress. It was like the old school bodybuilder mindset. You got to be training to failure, right? And if that were the case, you wouldn't need an RPE because everything would be an RPE 10, right? But newer and newer research, especially over the last decade, is starting to show more and more so training to failure is not oftentimes not the best thing you could do. It's usually the less optimal thing you could be doing, right? Like, for example, and I pulled this up, there's a systematic review and meta analysis out of the University of Sydney, and it collected eight different studies that were comparing training to failure versus individuals who are training just short of failure, which is categorized as one to three reps short of failure. And there's actually consistent advantages to the non-failure training groups when it comes to strength and hypertrophy increases over time. And the longer these tend to go, the more noticeable that difference becomes, right? So actually stopping short of failure typically gives you an advantage long-term in building more muscle, building more strength. And that's confusing. Right? It's confusing to a lot of people, but here's why that tends to work. Because I think people usually see things on like the first order consequences instead of going down second or third order consequences. Because what does training to failure mean? You're going to build up fatigue much faster during your workout, right? If I'm doing a chest day and I start by taking three sets of bench press to absolute failure, and then I'm going into like an incline dumbbell press. Would I be stronger on that dumbbell press right after I did three sets of failure on bench? Or would I be stronger if I saved a little gas in the tank? I'd end up being stronger, right? I'd have a lot more energy, a lot less fatigue to actually make it through the next exercise and the next one through the entirety of a workout, right? You also increase your risk of injury, overtraining, burnouts, plateaus, right? So you're doing all this. So it's, it might seem like more work because you're taking it to failure and it hurts more. But overall, you tend to do less because you're not lifting as heavy of weights through the entirety of the workout, right? And when you stack them side by side, you're seeing the same or less progress than if you stop just short of failure. And that's where this RPE idea comes in, right? So the main goal for a lot of people is to work between like an RPE of seven to nine, occasionally take it to 10. And there's different methods that you can progress this, which we'll probably talk about more in a future episode. But here's how you would use it. And I think this is where it'll make more sense if you're lost right now is let's say I've got the goal of my workout today is three sets of 10 on squats, right? Three sets of 10 on squats. And the goal is to hit an RPE of eight, which means two reps left in the tank at the end of each set. Let's say set one, I use 135 pounds, right? I squat 10 times, I rack it and I say, how many more reps could I have done? And in my head, I'm like, okay, that was challenging, but I honestly, I probably could have gotten four or five more. Those would have been a tough four or five reps, but I could have done four or five more. So what does that tell me is, well, I wanted to use a weight where I only had two reps left in the tank, but I had four or five. Okay. So my next set, I'm going to try and increase weight. So let's say I go from 135 to 155, right? I want to get closer to failure, but let's say I go to 10 reps again. I rack the weight and I'm like, okay, how many more reps do I have in the tank? And I'm like, man, honestly, zero, like zero to one. Maybe that was a hard set. I don't know if I could have done another one that tells me 155 is a little too heavy. So that just helped me find, okay, 135 was too light. 155 was too heavy. I should be set at 145. So it helps you fine tune where you need to be working in an ideal range. And that's a very basic breakdown of how that could work. Cause you could use this in programming in so many different ways. Mm. And especially I know like you, like us, we'll use it like for strength athletes you use it and change RPE sets for every single set or day. It's it, you can use it in a lot of different ways, Yeah, but that's a breakdown of where it is. Cause is that the most common way you use to assess intensity during training or weight choice? Yes. And it is when it clicks for people, it is so impactful when it comes to knowing how much weight you should be moving. This could be from beginner all the way to it. If you're intermediate or advanced and you've never used it yeah. because it, that is one of the biggest challenges sometimes is mm -hmm. feeling like I'm not sure if I'm pushing myself too much, or if I'm not pushing myself at all, I don't know where to start. It really makes you understand not only what your body is capable of doing, but also what your level of difficulty looks like when it comes yeah. to your ability to push weight. 
it's really hard to conceptualize. But when you have this guiding point, and what I explain it to my clients very basically in the beginning is RPE is going to help you determine how much weight you should be moving. Yeah. That's what it can help you do and how hard you should be working at each set you're doing. And it allows you to fine tune that process. And it's a little bit of experimenting in the beginning for sure. But it's really cool when it clicks and you're like, Mm -hmm. wow, I I feel like I really know my body and I know what I can do and what I can't do right now. Yeah. You know exactly what it's capable of Mm -hmm. for sure. And that's kind of the fun part in dialing it in because a lot of the times people say, is it like maybe if you're not making progress, is it your workout program as a whole? Is it your diet? Is it whatever? And if you don't know where your intensity is, I know this is honestly a very common theme I see with people that aren't making progress in the gym, not necessarily body composition, but just in the gym is they're not using the right intensity. They're working hard, but they're working at like an RPE three, four, or five, which is still a challenging set, but it's nowhere close to the intensity they need. And if you don't check yourself, and that's why I like the RPE is because it kind of forces you just to think about it, is if you just put that on autopilot, you're going to get stronger over time. So the weight that you were doing a couple months ago, if you're still just putting that on, just going through the motions, that's probably not what your body needs to actually grow. Mm-hmm. Right? And I think yeah. a good way to determine this, I don't know if you've ever done this. I do this occasionally with clients and once in a while for myself, because the next question is, how do you know exactly where, like how many reps you have left? Because it's a, it's a feeling that you have to kind of get down. Mm-hmm. And one of my favorite ways to do it, and this is why I think taking form videos of yourself is so important. And obviously we do it with clients, but even if you don't have a coach, Take a form video of yourself doing an exercise that is safe to fail on. What do I mean by that? I mean something like a barbell bicep curl where the worst case scenario is if you go up for a rep and you fail, the weight just goes back down. Where if you fail on a squat, you get crushed. That's what I mean, like a safe exercise or like a leg extension on a machine, something like that. And set a weight and just take it to absolute failure until you see yourself physically fail. And then you can look back at the video and start saying, okay, oh, this was the rep right here. Two before I failed, this was an RPE eight. And you can look at that feeling and you're like, oh, I know how that feels. Because the feeling transfers, right? Different exercises are more or less challenging than others. But the feeling transfers where if you can get a good tone on what it feels like to be at an RPE eight on a curl, on a leg extension, all these, you start to get a better feeling of what that's like all around. Yeah. And I think that's a helpful tool, I think, for a lot of people to say like, okay, check yourself. And here's every time I freaking do this, I surprise myself. And I think a lot of people do is I realized I'm like, oh, I was being a freaking wimp, right? I was at least one or two over-exaggerating my RPE score than it really was. When you go to absolute failure, because that is a hard set if you're going to failure. Yeah. Have you ever done that test? Failure just sucks. I have, yeah, I, I do it. I don't do it often, but I'll do it when I feel like I'm not pushing yeah. myself as hard as I need to, or if I'm experimenting with a new machine. Mm, That's a humbling typically experience. when I'll do it. And it's also really nice because... I know people can sometimes struggle with progressive overload. This, if you're tracking your workouts, which is really, really helpful, and I highly recommend it. But over time, this can help you if you feel like you've been, you're pushing weight that for a little bit, that was an RPE of eight. Mm. But one day you get to the gym and a few days in a row, it's an RPE of a five or six. All right, now now it's time to maybe I – However, you're going to apply progressive overload, increase my weight, increase the number of how I'm doing my, how many sets I'm doing, how many reps, whatever it is. But you have that guiding point. You have something to look at to show you, oh, I am improving. My strength is increasing right now because two weeks ago, this was an eight and now it is a five or a six. All right. It's time to increase However, I, I try to not say something that's set in stone, but it's time to apply my progressive overload principle. Exactly. Yeah. Doing that. <laughs> exactly. It's a good signal of telling you where. And I think if you're someone who's like listening, you're like, wow, this sounds like it'd be super helpful, but it is a little confusing, especially to use it first. And I mean, when you have a coach, it's easier, right? Because it, it applies and goes like this. If you're not one tool I love to use, and this is second to tracking your workouts, first of all, like you just said, like if you don't use an app, I think Stacked is a free app that I like on the app store. It's called Stacked, where you can track them. I think actually Mike Matthews developed that a long time ago and just left it there. Doesn't talk about it anymore, but it's an amazing free app that you can track your workouts or even just in your freaking notes app, right? Like just writing that down can be so huge. The second to that though, is instead of just aiming for one 
singular rep goal, like three sets of 10. Using rep ranges and just training to an RPE of eight, let's say, is massive because how many days do we go in? And this is common for everybody. If you get a bad night's sleep and you ate like crap yesterday and you're stressed, are you going to feel as strong in the gym as if you got a great night's sleep, you've had a couple meals in you, and you just got a great news at work? No. Like weight move, like your strength is going to increase. So using a rep range gives you the flexibility. So you know you're taking each set to, to at least get yourself the stimulus you need to grow. So instead of saying like three sets of 10, and then potentially on the day, right, using like let's whatever weight you're using could be a little too light and you could have done maybe 13, 14, or 15 reps with it, or absolutely killing yourself to get to that 10th rep, right? You're doing a couple, you know, technically failed reps, but getting to 10 reps. Instead of doing that, if you say three sets of eight to 12, and I'm stopping at an RPE of eight, you know that feeling. And then that way you can use your weight and you can say, I, it's going to be between eight and 12 reps, but I'm going to stop at RPE eight. So the first set that might be 11, the second set that might be nine, but it, that's what matters. And I think we talked about that in the building a training program mm -hmm. episode from a while back. Like the rep count is not as important as people used to think for hypertrophy, high strength, you're going to get, if you're training close to failure, you could be using three reps, six reps, 12 reps, 20 reps. As long as you are training, like taking it close to failure, that close to failure, you are going to give yourself the stimulus you need to grow. So that's where I think rep ranges can stress people out. But once you know that, it can be a huge tool to make sure at least every set you did today was an effective set, not just junk volume, not just a waste of time. It was effective. And that's why I think this RPE scale, I really think more people would benefit from using it to make yeah. their workouts, like to get what you want out of your workouts and not just wasting time. Mm -hmm. It's a big one. Is there anything I left out there on RPE? My brain was no. too busy doing numbers and it was worrying about not screwing up. I probably did something wrong with math there. <laughs> no, I think you did a good job. It's something that you guys are definitely going to have to practice. Like you're going, it's going to take a little bit for it to click, but it's going to be really helpful. I know before I used it, I used to just, I always felt like I never knew what to expect with myself. I'm like, am I being yeah. consistent? Like how, what if I just feel stronger one day and then the next, like, where should I be working? I don't know. I used to just be confused about weights and this, you know, this was, I also got time to put into the gym to learn more. I was young, but having that some sort of guiding principle was really, really helpful instead of feeling like I was always going in blind with how much weight I should do. Absolutely. Especially as a beginner. I think this yeah. is really something to start. Like if you can implement it at any point of your, you know, fitness weightlifting journey, but especially if you are a beginner, this is something that can really, I think, accelerate your progress. Like as you yeah. become better in the gym and feel more comfortable with yourself because it's weird. Weight, lifting weights is sometimes really awkward <laughs> and weird oh, and you don't know what you should be doing. <laughs> a lot of the time it can be freaking awkward. Yeah. So that's yeah. a good one to use. That's a freaking good one to use. Well, there we go. Okay. That's round robin number two. Let us know what y'all think. Shoot us a DM if you like this one. If you like the training topics, it reminds us a lot too. And I know we're going to do this in the future, but it reminds us a lot of the Q and A episodes we do every single Friday for the premium side. Mm -hmm. All right. So every single week we do it, we get to break down these topics that you guys actually get to ask, which I freaking love, which it reminds me of a little bit. So you can sign up if you want to check that out down below. We'll put it in our show notes. Same thing too. If you're getting that Legion new pre, shoot me a DM. I want to hear how it is. If you get it before me, I just ordered it today. And uh, we're rock and rolly polioli from there until, until we come up with a outro we just keep testing things out <laughs> that's what we'll do i know i just can't think of anything without sounding corny like i think i like your whoop, whoop. what do you whoop, whoop. i really know i like that i can't do it I don't really... <laughs> put that on some merch that's what we'll do but hope you all have a beautiful week talk to you next time